our final speakers, in particular Tyler Cowan, uh, who is visiting us from uh, Northern Virginia today. He is the chair of the economics department at George Mason University. He leads the Mercatus Institute. Uh, he's written a number of best-selling books, including Stubborn Attachments, uh, The Great Stagnation, and others. He writes a column for Bloomberg. Um, he has a very popular podcast called Conversations with Tyler. Uh, we will actually use some of the formats and elements of that uh, in the discussion today that I'll have with Brendan Wallace, uh, uh, managing partner and co-founder of Fifth Wall, who I think needs no introduction in this room, certainly. So without uh, further delay, uh, Tyler, Brendan, uh, come on up. So just to add to that, I would say um, Tyler does have incredible range. So in terms of the questions and the content of those questions, I'd say as wide and diverse as you'd like. Politics, geopolitics, <laughs> economics, real estate, anything. So fire away. Um, so why don't I start with just kind of introducing you to the audience, Tyler. Can you just tell everyone um, what it is that you do at, at the Mercatus Center? The Mercatus Center is at George Mason University. We try to solve the world's problems. We have staff a bit over 150. Most importantly for this group, we are long real estate. We had leased extra space a number of years ago uh, in a very bullish manner, and this has worked out very well for us. So I'm in sympathy with the general view uh, that real estate is a good investment. So um, obviously we have a lot of real estate owners um, in the room from a lot of different asset classes, a lot of different geographies. If you were to you know, be talking to a board in the real estate industry, irrespective of sector and irrespective of geography, what should a real estate owner be most nervous about with respect to technology, in your view? The number one factor to be most nervous about, and you see it in California right now, is poor governance. So there are plenty of dry places in the world that have wildfires and deal with the problem. Australia would be one example but they let their public utilities charge higher rates, they spend more on maintenance and preservation, and they have less of a problem. They realize nature is a potential threat. When you have bad governance, you will not get your problem solved. Climate change will be a bigger issue. So I think by far that is the number one issue and risk for a great deal of real estate today. And do you see that being materially different between, say, the U.S. and the rest of the world? I would say even within the United States, there are great differences. So governance in Los Angeles, in my view, is somewhat better than in San Francisco. Uh, governance in Northern Virginia is actually, in general, quite good. Uh, governance in Denmark and Singapore is excellent. But again, it depends exactly where you look and when. So another question I would have is, you know, we think a lot about the big existential questions that real estate owners should be thinking about. And I think for anyone who's invested in real estate, either individually or commercially, the axiom has always been location, location, location. That location drives real estate asset value. But I think because of technology, because of mobile, because of on-demand, because of logistics technology, it feels like the meaning of location is changing. And as a result, the importance of location in a particular asset's value is changing. How do you think about that? Do you think? the importance of location will increase in a particular asset's value or decrease over time? What I see in the data is that location is mattering more and more. That in every urban or suburban area, people, markets are drawing lines. And on one side of the line, there is a boom. On the other side of the line, things may be OK, but there is no boom. And figuring out where is the line and where the line will be. And here's my model behind why location matters more than before. Think about Facebook, Google, Apple, other just phenomenal companies who have made amazing breakthroughs. We think about their breakthrough in terms of the product, the Facebook page, right, or Google search. That's all true. But there's another and in some ways more fundamental breakthrough they've made, and that is a new way of organizing, hiring, and managing talent, putting people together in very talented clusters, being very careful with hiring, how they monitor the quality of employees, how they encourage people. 
And that model, I think, will spread to more and more American sectors, and they will be less sluggish and more dynamic. And it is the spread of that model that is driving the greater value of location, because that model works. It's striking. You look at Google, you think, oh, you know, they're search. They're a one-trick pony. Well, we just read uh, at Google they've cracked the problem of quantum supremacy. Most of us probably use Gmail. Uh, driverless vehicles, Google slash Alphabet, have had a critical role behind. So it's not just one product. It's a new way of organizing talent. And that, I think, is the fundamental point for real estate in the future. And I guess kind of a, a related question is, you can and think about. On that, what, tell me, what do you think? Uh, is location going to matter more or less? Am, am I allowed to do this? Yeah, I, so I'd say <laughs> I, feel, I feel a little bit outmatched here. Um, but uh, I would say that there's kind of two competing vectors in my mind. Yeah. I think you have, on the one hand, you know, increasingly distributed workforces that kind of would seem to make location less important. Um, you have on-demand services where, you know, you don't go to the store. The store comes to you with on-demand and with e-commerce. And you have, you know, buildings being built more flexibly. So, you know, lots of different use cases you can accommodate. And so that would suggest that, you know, on, on the one hand, location is less important. It's more amorphous. Um, on the other, you know, we look at some of the trends that are particularly relevant in the technology space. So, like, edge data centers. So the need to drive compute powder, like, to the edge of a network. So actually in a building. So you can think of a, a building not just as commercializing or selling space, but actually being a data center in itself. You need to push that data to the edge. And another trend would be um, kind of distributed energy production, right? So like buildings turning into power plants themselves, being able to sell energy back into the grid, or even things like uh, drone delivery, right? So if, if actually goods are moving through the skies, you're going to actually need to monetize the airspace above well-located real estate. So that would suggest that you know, better located real estate would actually become more valuable. I, I'm not clear on where it exactly nets out. My hunch is that better located real estate, in, certainly in cities, becomes more valuable. But I would say, to throw it back to you, a, a question that I think is um, kind of like a, a counterpoint to that is, uh, autonomous vehicles are, are, are in their nascency, right? They're, they're not right. mass commercialized. And to the extent they become mass commercialized and to the extent everyone has one, I think it's reasonable to expect that the form factor of the car might change. So instead of sitting there staring at the bumper in front of you with your hands at you know 10 and 2, you could be sleeping in your car, you could be eating in your car, you could be working in your car, and as a result, the pain of commute times might go down. And so people might be commuting two hours to go to work and sleeping the last two hours of the night in their car. Do you think that accelerates urban sprawl? Do you think that's a trend that will actually accelerate urban sprawl? Because the counterpoint is that vehicle ownership is actually on the decline. I'm curious to get your view around how transportation impacts these CBDs. I think driverless vehicles will boost the exurbs, but it is more like 30 years away than five years away. So there was a period when everyone thought self-driving cars were crazy, then everyone got very enthusiastic, didn't quite think through the last mile problem. Also, regulation is a big issue here in governance. When regular cars started in the early 20th century, they killed a very large number of people. They were extremely dangerous. P there were no driver's licenses, tires were terrible, no one knew how to drive. But as a society, we put up with that. Whether or not you think that was the right thing to do, we put up with it. Today, we are not willing to put up with those levels of carnage for self-driving vehicles. So they will have to be almost perfect before we give them free reign. And that's just not any time very soon. So I say 30 years. I used to think it would maybe be 5 to 10, then I got pushed up to 20. Right now I'm at 30. Uh, that to me is a disappointment. So now to put you even more on the spot, kind of in consideration of all of that with a lot of real estate owners in the room, if you were kind of X owner of a particular asset class, where would you buy more? And I'll just go through a handful of asset classes. Sure. Hotels, where would you buy more? Again, it depends what the comparison is, but I think the key question is, again, are you on the correct side of the line? I would be bullish on all forms of real estate properly located. So I'm bullish on most of the global economy, bullish on the United States, on most sectors. They're not making more land. But through the use of data and just commutes being tough, markets will more and more ruthlessly judge the quality of real estate. But I absolutely would go along hotels. Is that 
getting at your question? It is, and, yeah. and kind of now let's talk about industrial, right? Okay. It, it, the logistics infrastructure to support this exponential growth of e-commerce is becoming incredibly distributed, but at the same time, it needs to be central, actually, in cities. How do you think about where industrial owners should be allocating capital? I grew up in northern New Jersey, which probably many of you know, which in the 1970s was very much an area of industry. Or if you think about Los Angeles, there's a place here called City of Industry, but industry has been leaving. So I don't think a lot of industry will be located nearly as close to urban centers as it used to be. I think it will be more spread out. It will depend on labor policy, wages, and very much quality of local governance. So I would look most of all to the American South and just unusual places that were giving good deals to people wanting to set up production. So I want to shift and talk a little bit about Los Angeles. Um, Great, so well, you my wrote favorite that, city. That LA has the entrepreneurial culture and the talent and the infrastructure to match the Bay Area as an innovation hub. And I guess what I'm curious about is two questions. One, what makes any place special um, as a, a driver of innovation, as a hotbed of new technology and new startups? And then what in particular is unique about Los Angeles in your mind? Los Angeles is one of America's two largest cities. There's phenomenal talent here. You have much better weather than San Francisco. I would say much better food. For all of its flaws, it's much better run. San Francisco has gotten worse each year I've gone there. And in some ways, governance in that city peaked maybe in the early 1990s. I do think there are problems here with the ethos. So here, arguably, there's too much of a culture of narcissism. Uh, the Bay Area may have a culture of narcissism, but it's a more intellectual narcissism. <laughs> so people there read more books, and even bookstores here, it's striking. You go to Book Soup up on Sunset. How many of the titles reflect an interest in entertainment? So Los Angeles needs to become more intellectual. The good weather may in some ways be a curse, but the merging of entertainment and tech and this just being a better place and a far larger place, and I think in the longer run, being much closer to Mexico is also a plus, uh, as Mexico will become more and more important for US manufacturing as the Chinese connection somewhat fades. So I'm very bullish on Los Angeles. I sincerely believe it's probably the single best place in the world to live. Uh, it has some problems in attracting tech, but you see the cluster happening now, and indeed Fifth Wall is part of that, and I mean, maybe you can tell us why you put Fifth Wall here rather than uh, you know, Birmingham, Alabama, or the Bay Area. I wish I could say I had the, the extent of like, the macroeconomic inputs to the decision, but um, I just lived here. So. <laughs> but that's endogenous, right? <laughs> maybe there's a lot of trends behind why I lived here, but, and I managed to convince Brad to commute down. So um, it wasn't nearly as, as, as logical or thought out. I would say that it has been exciting to be a part of the growth of the LA tech and venture ecosystem. Um, I think more and more talent actually wants to be located in Los Angeles. You're seeing more successful startups. You're seeing uh, just a growth in the amount of, of AUM, the amount of capital that, that can deploy into early stage companies. Um, and I think what hasn't happened in Los Angeles yet that has happened in the Bay Area is that there have been exits in the Bay Area. So there's been a lot of wealth created and what do entrepreneurs do and employees of startups do when they make a lot of money? They invest in other startups. That hasn't really happened yet in Los Angeles, but I think very shortly it will and that will kind of spawn further growth of the LA ecosystem, which we're excited about. And keep in mind, venture capital is in some ways much older here. So movies are projects, most of them fail, you're judging talent. The two earliest forms of venture capital in American history, the first is Hollywood, and the other actually is the whaling industry, Herman Melville and Moby Dick and New England in the mid 19th century. That too is venture capital. So it, it's not the inherent property of the Bay Area. I don't think the Bay Area will dwindle. I think it will do fine. There's so much there, but I do think this will arise as a kind of co-center uh, with more and more just wealth and talent shifting to America's West Coast. All right, so now I have uh, some, some rapid fire questions. Okay, um, I thought those were rapid fire questions. Th these are even more <laughs> rapid fire. So um, I'm gonna ask you to paint a picture for us of what the world will look like uh, with one particular parameter in mind. Great. So retail. Let me start with and the- about 15 years out from today. 
Let me start with the general point. You ask people these questions and you'll get all kinds of breathless answers about how nothing will be the same and everything is dynamically changing. That very often is wrong. A lot of things don't change that quickly. So until very recently, we were flying planes from the 1970s designed in the late 1960s and no one back then would have believed it. Uh, but that said, in retail, I think the real advances we're seeing already will come in delivery, delivery, delivery. The American future I see as one where there will be much more traffic congestion, due in part to delivery and ride sharing. Many more urban and suburban areas will move to congestion pricing, which will be quite unpopular, but it will be necessary, and you will just be able to get stuff basically by talking into the air, and it will appear in your home in less than 24 hours. Uh, I think in some ways this is almost kind of a lonely vision. I like going out shopping. Uh, I don't actually want it to change my life that much. I do want congestion pricing. I still want to drive to my local Whole Foods, but I think a, an additional large chunk of that market will be delivery-based. Parking garages. Parking garages. I think parking regulations in the United States have been crazy, so there's all this minimum parking, and it takes up big parts of cities, and it makes cities ugly, and it leads to traffic issues, and it's probably difficult to back out of that system given how many parking garages we have. Ever visit the cities in you know, upstate New York and see all their parking garages? It's terrible, like Buffalo. Uh, I hope that due to forms of microtransportation, we won't make that mistake again, and we will back off on mandated parking everywhere and have fewer parking garages. I get lost in them, I can't find my car, I avoid them like the plague. Uh, it's a kind of first world problem, uh, but I don't like them. And I don't think they necessarily serve people that well. So I don't think they're going anywhere, but I, I wouldn't necessarily be that long on them. It's interesting to think about, you know, for example, airport parking, right, has been on the decline for the, the last handful of years, in part because of ride sharing. Probably most people took an Uber or a Lyft to, from the airport and to the airport. And so it's a category that I think used to be seen as this almost like an annuity, but frankly, it, it's changing so rapidly today. When um, I click on my Uber at 7.30 a.m., it knows where I'm going. It just says, Dulles Airport, right? I don't even have to type anything in. So that's parking garages. So 15 years out, surveillance and security for real estate assets. Surveillance is probably the number one growth sector in most advanced countries in the world. It makes me nervous, but I think homeowners want it. People with kids want it. People who are afraid of crime want it. A lot of merchants want it. It will be efficient in most individual cases. It will solve concrete problems. Uh, but at the same time, I fear for the long run fate of a society where everything and everyone is watched. But I would be very long surveillance as an investment and it's happening very, very rapidly. And uh, it is possible and it works. There are parts of China, you jaywalk across the street and you get a text message 15 seconds later informing you that a certain amount of money has been deducted from your bank account. So. If you look at, say, the United Kingdom, where closed circuit TV has been around for longer, it's basically popular. So I don't see some kind of movement of voters or citizens defeating it. Home ownership. I think home ownership is going to make a comeback. Sluggish home ownership and household formation is a key reason why the recovery from the earlier recession has been so sluggish. Uh, millennials and Generation Z are maybe in some ways slower to grow up. But owning a home is rewarding. Having a family is rewarding. And I think those truths will reemerge. And I don't know where you all live. Probably a decent chunk of you, you know, live on the coasts. But I would say make sure every single year, two or three times, you visit places like Topeka, Kansas, or Birmingham, Alabama, or wherever it's going to be, places that are not major cities on the coasts. And Americans still want to own homes. Uh, again, I'm very bullish there. I get the problem. Uh, it's tough when you have student debt. Wage growth has been slow. But the last five years, actually, median incomes have been rising again. And that bodes well for family formation, household formation, home ownership. Vehicle ownership. Vehicle ownership. It depends. I think in Los Angeles, Bay Area, Washington, Washington DC, New York City, it is going down. You see this, you read about it. It is a thing, it is a trend. There's the e-scooter, there's Uber, whatever you want it to be. Uh, subways are not working that well. Uh, that's great, but I think in terms of the aggregate statistics for the country as a whole, it won't show up as much as 
people are saying, because media in this country are super concentrated in a few places, and they see microtransport, which you know I think will do fine. But again, travel around the United States, uh, I think car ownership is robust. So a question that, that I in particular wanted to ask was, you know, real estate has been in the business of bringing people together, right, for shared resources or for organization or for commerce, that there's this need to be together, for businesses to be close together. I mean, that drove why cities formed in the first place. And I think today, through technology, it feels like we're more connected than ever, right? We're connected with our phones, we're connected through social media. But at the same time, most people report um, higher levels of loneliness and a lack of connection. And I'm curious as you think about the role that real estate owners have to play in making people feel more connected to the communities around them and to the businesses around them. What do you think the role of real estate owners is in, in really driving that renewal of community in cities? We need to make our spaces better and to work better. And very often citizens are doing this for us. So where I live, Northern Virginia, there's a huge, very expensive plan to refit Tyson's Corner. It may well work, we'll see. It's taking years. There's another part of my local area called Angelica Mosaic, where there's just a mall was put up and it's actually quite walkable. And everyone wants to go there. And the whole area around Angelica has been filled in very rapidly. It's packed all of the time. Uh, it wasn't so much part of the big plan. People just crave something like a downtown area. So I think we will solve these problems whether the planners are always on board or not. And we'll solve them pretty quickly in a lot of cases. People crave human contact. Uh, it's striking to me, my wife grew up in the Soviet Union, where of course there much lower living standards and people relied on friends. You couldn't just throw money at a problem. No one had any money, there were no markets. Relationships were very close. So the fundamental culprit, I think in a way, is wealth more than tech per se. Tech in some ways helps bring people together. Uh, but we've now overshot and we're looking for ways to claim back that human contact and by being together and having these well-functioning efficient spaces, I think mostly we'll get it. So the next question I have is really about um, security and in particular like national security and real existential threats. So, you know, I think you used to conceptualize national security as protecting America's borders, right? And as increasingly as the, the threat of an invasion of our borders becomes more and more improbable, I think the the, the focus shifts towards digital attacks on our assets, um, in particular critical infrastructure in a city. Say you have an attack on a building's elevator system or you have a rogue drone uh, driving an assassination attempt using facial recognition. And what that would suggest is that real estate owners need to collaborate more closely um, with local security authorities and frankly have a role and a hand in shaping national security policy. How should real estate owners be thinking about their role in both asset level security and national security in an increasingly digital world? I think future warfare will often be cyber warfare. You could argue that by previous standards, the US is at war with three countries right now, Iran, Russia, China. They probe our systems, we probe theirs. They're not quite making an attack on us, uh, but it's extremely unsettling. I think we need more leadership at the national level, so in terms of what can an individual business do? Well, of course, make sure your systems are better protected, but a lot of the actual societal risks are systemic and have to do with public utilities, transportation systems, metros, uh, voting systems, how votes are registered and countered, and we need much higher layers of protection. So I would say at some point we'll have like a cyber version of 9-11 and then be prepared to actually pay some extra taxes and charges to shore up these lines of defense but you alone acting as individuals, I mean, do what you can, but you, for the most part, you cannot solve these problems. They're at higher levels. But you think it takes an attack. You think it takes a real cyber attack to elevate consciousness that we actually need to focus on this. We are absolutely in denial. And the people I know who hold positions in government, say like senators who get intelligence briefings, they are much more terrified than anyone else. And there's a reason why they're terrified. They hear what is going on. And again, it's something hard for us to respond to. Like, what exactly do I do? Whose side do I take? You know, for whom do I vote? Where do I donate money? No simple answers. Uh, but yes, I believe we are in denial. All right, so I'm gonna do something you do in, in your interviews, which is you just, I give you um, a topic and you say underrated or, and or overrated. And that and means why. I get to do one back to you, so go okay. on. Okay, yeah. all right. Um, 
so this will be very relevant for everyone in this room. Co-working and WeWork, underrated or overrated? Well, you know, WeWork not long ago was very overrated, but at this point, it's very underrated. So it's assumed by the media the whole thing was just a fraud. And there were a lot of highly questionable business practices, but I think you can make the argument there is still room for some version of a company like WeWork. I don't think it is going to be WeWork. So clearly there's room for processing and repackaging real estate on the local level. But is it truly a national level business where there's an economy of scale from having a large network at the national level? I think as more and more companies branch and expand and have people working for them you know, with some distance, I think there is. So I guess I'm going to say WeWork is actually by now underrated. Underrated. It's underrated, but I mean, my goodness, until you know, a month ago, it was extremely overrated, right? Yeah, I would say a month ago is definitely overrated. I would say co-working as a concept is, is, continues to be underrated. I, I agree. Most studies we've seen suggest that flex office, which kind of co-working is a component of, um, will grow dramatically. And I think what WeWork did is it was kind of a harbinger of change for the real estate industry. They saw that you can make leases more flexible, you can consumerize real estate, you can make real estate feel more on demand, you can think of real estate and space as a service. And that changed the mindset and the psyche of a lot of real estate owners, and that was a positive. WeWork itself, I think, was a victim of you know, a lot of what's happening in Silicon Valley right now, these incredibly inflated private sector valuations and heavily loss-making companies. And frankly, you know, at some point, their, their time was up. Um, but I think WeWork showed real estate owners um, a path that they're now pursuing, many of the owners in this room as well. I live FlexiWork. I have three different offices. At first, people told me I was crazy. More and more people are finding they're more productive this way. And I think it's a trend of the future to learn how to make that work. All right, so next, co-living. Underrated or overrated and why? You know, I think in general, how we use space has never had to face up to the world of actual data. So everything we do about using space, we're doing wrong for the most part. I think what we need to do is take the management techniques you see at Facebook, Google, Apple, many other places, and just apply data to concrete problems and how we use space, how we carve it up, who is in it when and where, what are the rules that regulate the use of space, will be changed in every single part of our lives, maybe even including, you know, who does the household chores. And uh, I think that's a big advance. It sounds like a small thing, but in terms of making people actually better off and more productive, there's so much inertial bias and just sticking with how things have been. Uh, the sec the whole allocation of space question, whether it's traffic, should we let so many cars park on the street? Of course not. It's an insane waste of space. Hardly ever do people realize that. Uh, how many offices should you have? What should you do in which one? Where should you spend time with whom and for how long? I think all of that is going to be revolutionized in the next 20 years. Big series of games. I would agree, <laughs> actually, with all yeah. that. Um, so next one, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency, underrated or overrated? You know, Eric Weinstein asked me that exact same question yesterday. And I said, Eric, I think there's a 20 to 30% chance uh, it will become very important. And I think everyone either way overrates it or way underrates it. So there are people who are, you know, absolutely pro crypto fanatics. And then there are people who think the whole thing's a fraud. And I think it's still unproven. The actual use cases are not with us. It's not clicking in terms of there's a user demand out there that needs to be satisfied. It's right now competing with gold in portfolios as a hedge, which is fine. And there's a chance it takes off, but still unproven. But your take? I would say it's underrated. Underrated. And I think we, we see a lot of applications in real estate capital markets that are just, they're kind of really, really early. Frankly, we're not even ready to invest in them yet. Mm -hmm. um, but the opportunity is, is definitely there. So we're really excited yeah. about it. All right, one that's very relevant for Fifth Wall, um, electric scooters. I've never been on one. I'm terrified. We can fix that. <laughs> uh, I think they will stick. But I think at some point, they will hit a kind of regulatory wall, and we will have to decide how much risk are we willing to let people take. And I think there will be enough cities that allow them to continue, that I think they are underrated. Um, but we'll, we'll need to make that big decision, and there's a chance regulation shuts them down. So I'd say underrated, but with caution. Your view? I would say 
uh, underrated from a consumer adoption perspective. I don't think I agree there's with been that. a consumer mobility trend that has seen the traction that electric scooters have ever, frankly, from car ownership to ride sharing. Um, at the same time, they're the most threatened by regulation. And I think there is this kind of binary risk in a given city that a city can just shut them down. It happened in San Francisco. Uh, they were kind of growing incredibly fast in San Francisco. San Francisco kicked them out, and now they decided to let them back in until someone gets hurt, and they'll probably get kicked out again. So there's this incredibly binary risk to the business. Right. Paris loves them. I think they have a future, but not everywhere. So next up, Hyperloop. I suppose I'm bearish on Hyperloop. Uh, the number of acts of construction you need, the permits you need, the easements, the permissions from people, the number of municipalities or localities you need to go through, uh, their status quo bias. Yes, it will be wonderful to take the Hyperloop from LA up to San Francisco, but both the start and the end points, the real problem is getting to where the Hyperloop leaves. So say the Hyperloop you know, leaves from eastern LA and you live in Venice. That's the worst part of your trip. So within the area is most of the time, so cutting off time on the travel itself I think is a bit overrated. So uh, I'm a skeptic on Hyperloop. I would say I'm as, I am as well, um, for the very same reason. Yeah. Frankly, getting to downtown is worse than flying to San Francisco. Exactly. So, um, next up, London real estate in a no-deal Brexit. Underrated or overrated? Uh, underrated, but I don't think there'll be a no-deal Brexit. So there's now going to be an election uh, in mid-December, and odds are quite strong that the Tories do well and just push through the current Boris Johnson deal, which whatever you think of it is not no deal. And even if something weird happens in the election, uh, I think there'll just be more postponements. And people have seemed so allergic to no-deal Brexit. Uh, but that said, no-deal Brexit, which I'm not at all for, I think it would be a temporary blip, a strong negative, a lot of panic, can I get my medicine? A terrible thing. But in terms of real estate prices, I don't think it would matter at all. I think some London prices will return to sanity with whatever version of Brexit we get. And what the deal looks like in the long run uh, will only matter in the very short run. We just opened an office there, so I kind of have to say it's underrated. <laughs> London is in some ways the very best city in the world along so many dimensions. How nice it is, how well things work, how safe it is, how many productive neighborhoods you have. It's, at least for Americans, oddly underrated. In some ways, I would say how much better London has become than New York. And it was not that way. First time I went to London, 1979. Both cities were somewhat of a mess. And New York's gotten a lot better, but London, I would say, has pulled way ahead. And I'm bullish on it. All right, so in a similar vein, um, one I definitely don't have an opinion on, commercial office buildings in Hong Kong right now, not knowing the future. Uh, I suppose I am a pessimist on Hong Kong. I don't see good options on the table uh, for anyone. I'm not sure what the protesters are demanding or what kind of deal could be struck. So I think China is working hard to be able to do without Hong Kong on financial issues. And uh, there will be additional brain drain, and people from Hong Kong will leave to Canada, Taiwan, Singapore, other places, possibly the United States. And I think Hong Kong itself has become too oligopolistic in its core economy, not as free as it used to be. So I'm somewhat bearish on Hong Kong. Privatized infrastructure. Governments are running out of money, right? So almost all societies are aging. Pension requirements are higher, healthcare costs are higher, yet we still need to build infrastructure. We're going to look much more to the private sector, for better or worse. So I'm very bullish on private sector infrastructure. Where I live, Northern Virginia, we have lots of it. I take the toll road uh, out toward Dulles Airport. Uh, that's a private road. It works fine. No one thinks twice about it. Much more of it on the way. Drone delivery. It's a regulatory issue. It makes perfect sense. The economics are there, or will be there very, very soon. Uh, but how are we going to have the easements for the air? Where do the property rights really lie? If you're crossing multiple cities, counties, states, federal, they all want to say. Uh, terrorism authorities want to say. I think it will take quite a while to untangle that mess. So I would say compared to the breathless articles I read in like Atlantic, I think it's overrated, but I don't think it's overrated per se. I think at some point we'll figure it out. But my goodness, it's such a tangle. 
of laws and regulations. It's really going to challenge our institutions. All right, one that's very close to your heart. So brick and mortar colleges versus massive open online courses. Well, they're both overrated, I think. So <laughs> part of what college does, whether it's a MOOC or brick and, mor you know, brick and mortar, is to certify people. And as data get better, there are other ways of certifying people. So I think you know, the four-year college education should be three years, make people go over the summer, have classes on Saturdays, have many more shorter classes, test less, have fewer grades, but you have other ways of figuring out what people are good at. And uh, we have in some ways too much higher education for some people and not nearly enough for others. And we will fix that. But you know, I talked about this trend of all of these sectors in the American economy adopting these new dynamic team-oriented management models. The last one to do it well is going to be my sector, I promise you. Like you might think real estate in some ways is a bit status quo oriented or sluggish. And I mean, you all know better than I do. I'm sure there's something to that. But my goodness, my sector is going to come in last on these changes. And it will be brought there kicking and screaming. But with birth rates falling and the, the world aging, we're running out of students. So it's going to happen. We can't control our labor costs. It will hurt like hell. Uh, so both overrated. Last one. Universal basic income. Well, I think if you're just sending people a small amount of money, that's fine. It makes them better off. Uh, this is likely to be most useful in countries such as India, where I think it's an underrated idea. In the United States, we have the Earned Income Tax Credit, which in essence sends you money if you work. I think that's an underrated policy. So I'm not sure we're ever going to have this big thing, you know, guaranteed income, where you just live off it and you grow up and you say, I want to do finger painting and I'm 23 and I'm going to live off my UBI. I don't think we'll ever get there. And people want to work too. I don't think it would be good if we did. But the idea in general, in many parts of Africa, South Asia, I think is very underrated, has a big future. And those countries will grow out of it over time. Uh, but I think there's, there's something very important there. But do you have a view? Um, I would say, generally speaking, it's not something we really look at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I definitely think there's some merit to it. I think that allowing uh, for redistribution as kind of wealth inequality grows, the Gini coefficient accelerates in the US. Um, I think it prevents the kind of populism you're seeing in elections right now. And so I think that would definitely be a positive. You know, I think if you're bullish on real estate, I wouldn't call rent a tax, but there's something tax-like about it. You have to pay it to live in a city. Uh, so being bullish on real estate does imply there's some kind of distributional problem in the present, but also the future. So they are, in that sense, closely related. All right, so I think last question before we're cutting to uh, audience questions. So I want to ask you about climate change. Obviously, sure. it's um, incredibly relevant. There's three active fires burning in California right now. Um, their effects are really devastating. And I think you read about the effects of climate change in islands like the Maldives, and it's, it's really sad. Um, but I think whenever there's a trend, there's, there's almost always losers, but sometimes there are winners. Um, and counterintuitively, are there any geographies, are there any sectors of real estate that might actually benefit from rising temperatures and or rising sea levels? I'm curious to get your view on that. And after that, I'll give you my last question for you. But <laughs> Greenland, I don't mean this as a joke, but places in the northern latitudes, you have to ask, where can you do something useful? Where is there good governance? Uh, the Arctic, I worry that the land is not divvied up and there will be future conflict over it. I think that will be one of our biggest problems. Uh, Northern Sweden, I think, is extremely promising. It has empty land in a way, say, Denmark does not. And I think Greenland, uh, parts of it could be quite valuable. So I think the costs are much higher than the benefits. Russia has plenty of land but is too poorly governed, so they can't even fill the land they have. So I don't think it will help them. I think it, in some hypothetical world, could help them. But my last question for you, and I've been wondering all along, why is the company named Fifth Wall? What's the story behind that? I can give you the, the real answer or the, the fake real, answer. The real, well, whichever, both. I'll give you both. Uh, so the, the real answer is Brad and I uh, had a name uh, called Grey Wolf, but uh, unfortunately someone else had the name Grey Wolf, and so we were asked to stop using that politely with a cease and desist letter. Um, was that from a Grey Wolf or another company? There was another Grey Wolf okay, that basically yeah. said, you're not Grey Wolf, we're Grey Wolf. <laughs> um, 
then uh, Brad and I went to get beers and try to decide a new name, and we were kind of coming up with different names. And uh, I don't know, Fifth Wall just kind of stuck. It was just kind of a made-up name that we thought sounded good. Now, that's the real answer. The, the, the kind of answer we use a lot that I think many of the people in this room have heard is that we think of real estate as always having four-wall dimensionality. And when you talk about real estate, in particular re retail real estate, you think about your four-wall economics. But because of technology and because of digital, there's now this fifth wall that you, know, you increasingly have to focus on. So you can pick either answer. Um, <laughs> they're both equally true. Um, but actually, uh, touching on the question you just mentioned, I would be curious, because this is one of the questions I was reserving. Um, none of these asset classes actually exist. Um, and your, your Greenland comment made me think of it. So if these asset classes existed, should you buy them or should you not buy them? Okay. So these are made up, fictitious asset classes. Let's hear. Privatized national parks. It's hard to charge people a lot of money so I think even if we privatized, there would be an implied regulatory constraint. So I would not buy privatized national parks. I hope you don't ask me this one. Um, <laughs> land on Mars. I think that's a governance problem. So assume the technologies are in place whenever that comes. Well, who owns Mars? We're not very good at divvying up the Arctic, right? So I don't think we'll be very good at divvying up Mars. So you won't have secure property rights the other point I would make is, you know, when they fill in Nevada, I'll start thinking about Mars. So I would buy first in Nevada, second on Mars. And Nevada has some governance, I am told. Air rights above buildings. Uh, and, not, I, and not air rights in the sense that a lot of real estate owners think about it, where you can build more building, but actually air rights for drone delivery and kind of I would, in the sky. I would buy them and be bullish, but I would sooner invest in the law firms that will be dealing with the cases, <laughs> allocating those air rights. Um, last one, uh, you kind of answer this. I was going to ask you about Greenland. Is it a good deal or a bad deal for us to buy them? Well, at what price is always the question, as you all know. But here's the thing. So about 50,000 people live in Greenland, and most of them are of the tribes that have been in Greenland for quite a long time. And you know, right now, so oh, this is Greenland, this is ours, we're part of Denmark, we're never ever going to touch that arrangement. But over time, it seems to me that will in some way erode. And also, we're used to a world where large countries have stopped taking things from small countries. And I'm very glad that's how the world is now, but I don't think that's necessarily the future. Uh, that's actually been most of world history, is big countries take things from small countries. So I don't think Greenland is actually that secure. There's already a lot of Chinese pressure being brought to bear on it. And the notion that the United States, maybe in conjunction with NATO, does something to like keep out the Chinese, and it ends up somewhat carving up Greenland and parts of it are developed. I would say if you have a very long time horizon, like I'd love to make that bet. Uh, don't put the family savings into it. But if you're looking for long shot bets with a big payoff, uh, it's one I actually think is going to happen. It's just a question of when and how long you're willing to wait. But uh, do you have a Greenland take? I think we should buy it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whatever we can do. Yeah, well, I guess, so this now is from the audience. So one question, which I really like, is if you were to invest in any one technology or mm -hmm. idea, what would that be? Human capital. I think it will become more and more important. So either your own human capital or simply continuing to learn things is still underrated and just practicing at what you're good at. It sounds trivial, but I think that's where the really high returns are. More and more capital is uh, intangible rather than being like machine lathes. And the combination of people, teamwork, and then putting those people somewhere, which is what we've been talking about. I think that's where the action is. Real estate we've covered, yes, I'm bullish, but you've got to throw in human capital. What's the best book you read about real estate? And I like the second part of the question or where real estate is essentially a character? I like my own book, Average is Over, <laughs> <laughs> which is not mainly about real estate. Uh, but the best book about real estate may not be a book about real estate at all. It may be a book about general trends. So the title of that book, Average is Over, is a general trend, like areas will do really well or stagnate. And uh, I do discuss real estate, but it's probably 3% of the book. I don't know. So. I can't not recommend my own, so am I allowed to do that? Of course. 
So what are the best housing affordability crisis solutions you've seen? Building more housing uh, is by far the best. So I know areas are trying rent control. Economists, really from both parties of all views, pretty much agree that doesn't work. It works in the short run, but quality declines and you end up building less. There are some papers that suggest rent control makes the housing stock more expensive in the long run. Uh, there was a paper just came out about a week ago that if you took the California we know today and simply went back to building regulations from year 2000, which is not that long ago, right? And it was not laissez-faire at all. But go back to year 2000, the current California population would be more than 40% higher. And that's like, oh my goodness, that is a huge effect. Imagine a California. 40% higher than it is today. Than it is today. With the regulations from year 2000, which is not like going back to 1890, right? So we need to build more in many parts of this country. The American South and Mid-Atlantic have no problem doing that. California does. It is a disease afflicting this polity. I have to believe in the medium term it will be fixed. But NIMBY is strong and there's a lot of opposition. But my goodness, we need much more here to make San Francisco better, fill out Oakland. Oakland should look like Seoul, South Korea. And do you believe NIMBY is stronger in California than elsewhere in the US? Uh, than in most other places, yes, absolutely. Now, Hawaii NIMBY may be stronger yet, so maybe not stronger than anywhere. But of the major places, NIMBY is strongest here. But YIMBY is strongest here too. There's a war going on, as many of you know. And in the short run, I'm pessimistic. In the medium term, I'm optimistic. Uh, we will get more built, boost GDP, make everywhere more innovative. Uh, some of it will look uglier. But if you love Victorian homes, keep central San Francisco the same. Put the burden on Oakland, other places, south San Francisco, San Mateo. Uh, one way or another, I have to think it's going to happen. All right, this is a heavy one. <laughs> um, what is your projection for the 2020 presidential election in the US? <laughs> Well, there are betting markets which are online. You can access them at primary.guide. It's one of a number of betting sites. And these betting markets, I looked a few days ago, it said Trump's re-election chance was 39%. The Democratic favorite is Elizabeth Warren, somewhat over Joe Biden. But Biden, if nominated, has a better chance of beating Trump than does Warren. Now, I am not betting in that market. The fact that I'm not betting must mean that I agree with those estimates, or at least do not violently disagree with them. So I guess those have to be my calls. The market knows better than I do. That's what the market is telling us. Trump is neither doomed nor a shoe in but obviously it's a highly volatile, very unusual situation. How should Facebook address the misinformation problem on its platform? That is a very difficult question. Here's how I think of the world we live in. Due to the internet, every possible thing that can be said will be said. Every video that can be made, whether it's real or fake, it will be made. Every charge that can be leveled, every conspiracy theory that can be imagined, it will be out there. Uh, the question is, do you want to regulate Facebook heavily and push it into more obscure corners of the internet? I would say in the short run that decision will look pretty good. People will find it harder to get to. But over the medium term, they'll just arise websites. One of them might be called, all the really good stuff you can't get on Facebook and it will be very popular. So I actually favor some continued version of the status quo. New media bring big problems, as did the printing press. It takes a while to learn to use them well, and they get better over time. I'm worried we will overreact and limit free speech rights, and there's just not any part of our government I trust to regulate Facebook well. So uh, I'm willing to bite that bullet and you know grit my teeth and say, let us press on, I know it hurts, it could actually be a lot worse. So this is probably the most practical question um, I've gotten. How should airports be redesigned to deal with ride sharing? You know, the last time I flew into LaGuardia, I had to take a bus to get to the ride sharing area. And not for any logistical reason. They simply decided in their infinite wisdom that the ride sharing would take place somewhere else. So airports need to be redesigned to eliminate buses to the ride-sharing area. Just tolerate a bit more spontaneous order. Uh, you fly to a lot of countries in the world, there's a certain amount of chaos at the airport, but it actually organizes itself often remarkably well. So, uh, I mean, most airports should have a dedicated area for ride-sharing, but if there's some kind of problem that it's far away, just tolerate some disorder and let them do it. I mean, 
Let people be picked up. Don't go crazy over thinking this is some kind of priority. It isn't. So indexation has swept across many financial markets where investors seek passive market exposure. Um, how will alpha generation change? Um, and how will beta and real estate change? Alpha generation in financial markets, I think it's the Facebook, Google, Apple model. You get a team together of phenomenal people. You start a hedge fund. Not that many funds can hire enough talent, but you do some kind of quantitative analysis. And I think a small number of firms out there can systematically beat the market. And I think you see that in the data. And of course, they keep it a secret how they do it. But they do it using advanced mathematics and most importantly, their techniques for hiring and retaining talent. And that's probably going to stay that way for the foreseeable future. Uh, returns in real estate, again, it will get much more data intensive and more and more people will treat real estate just like a financial asset and you know, crack the numbers and take people knowing the most advanced mathematics in the world, people who are like too talented to teach in the math department at MIT, they'd rather earn the money, and they will bring that knowledge to bear on real estate and big data and machine learning and everything else that's already happening. Probably some of you here do it. And that's going to work. So there'll still be losses. It's not as clean cut as financial markets, which are super liquid and the data quality is very high and the bid ask spreads are much smaller. But still, it's going to work. It's going to change many things. We'll have a much better sense of what's a good real estate investment or not. And it's going to transform every part of human life, I think, not just real estate. Uh, and again, it will come last to higher education, but in due time, it will come there too. So now this is actually my question. This reminds me of our, our dinner the other night. You were talking a lot about the decoupling mm -hmm. of U.S.-China diplomacy and free trade. And so I guess one question is, do you expect that decoupling to accelerate? And if you were a real estate owner in the U.S., what would the effect of that decoupling have? I think so many U.S. companies putting their supply chains in China was a kind of bubble. It was based on a level of trust that was imagined and was never there. And with the Trump administration, the bubble has been burst. I don't think the bubble can be recreated. I don't think, say, Elizabeth Warren being elected would change any of this. Whatever you think of Trump, Warren, or anyone else, uh, I just feel it's the new reality that the US and China are actually not that good at cooperating together well once there is real conflict at stake. And the big winners, I think, will be uh, Vietnam, but most of all, Mexico. So I think a lot of Mexican real estate will become very valuable. To me, a fascinating real estate story, a place I used to live in the 90s is New Zealand. Home prices in Auckland and Wellington are phenomenally high, and New Zealand's quite an empty country. I used to drive around it, and I wouldn't see people for hours, and I'd see all these sheep. And if you had told me back then, well, Auckland will be one of the most expensive real estate markets in the world. I would have laughed or thought you were crazy. But the fact that that is possible is this huge cue. We're failing to find all the other areas where something like that will happen. And I think the best parts of Mexico will be on that list, absolutely. It has huge problems. It's a great country. People there, great work ethic. A lot of their institutions work fairly well. Productivity in a lot of Mexican factories is remarkably high. And uh, there are real estate plays to be made there. But again, with huge variance and a lot of no-go areas as well. It's a big one. Will, will the economy in the US enter a recession in the next 12 months? The chance of that is highly unlikely. There was a new GDP report released this morning. Probably a lot of you haven't seen it. The third quarter number was 1.9%. The economists' consensus forecast was 1.6%. 1.9 is not great. We'd been doing close to three down to 1.9, the normal is 2.2, but you look in all those numbers, do you see signs of a recession? You don't, and the clock is ticking, very unlikely. The worst number, by the way, was the structures number, but most of the, the bad news in that number came from uh, fracking and uh, fossil fuels, just because the prices there are low, and it's nothing that like normal real estate needs to worry about. So a lot of people have been calling a recession, often people, uh, critical of President Trump who just kind of feel something has to go wrong, a kind of justice theory of recessions. When you have a president, person X doesn't like, you get a recession. This doesn't work that way. Things are not great in every way. They seem fine. Small chance. Should the American Electoral College be abolished? It's very hard to get a constitutional amendment passed. So if you think of the Equal Rights Amendment, which whatever you might think of it, just kind of sounds good when you read it out loud. 
Uh, that hasn't been passed. And when I was a kid, which is now quite a while ago, people say, oh, we're, we're about to pass the ERA. So if you can't pass that, the very forces that benefit from the Electoral College won't let you change it. So we'll, we'll have that forever and ever, I say. What skills is the American workforce lacking, and which country is supplying those skills? The biggest skill lack, it's all skills, of course, writing, reading, arithmetic, but retraining yourself. So software changes rapidly, and whatever it is you think you have learned becomes obsolete. And the people in this room, I strongly suspect, are very, very good at retraining themselves. That's how you got here. But nowhere in school do they ever teach you that. They teach you to learn one set of things, and then they throw you out there. So that school needs to be more about how do you teach yourself 13 years down the line when like Microsoft Word isn't what you thought it was going to be or whatever changes come. So that's like the key skill. And the successful people I meet, like to a person, they're awesome at that. And that's where we're failing. Uh, I don't think other countries are beating us. I actually think on that America's number one. So I know you can read these stories like Finland, South Korea, Singapore. Oh, what great school systems they have. That's all true. They, they do better at the mean and the median than US. But in terms of like the talented people in those countries retraining themselves, US is way ahead of them, I think, uh, for the most part. It's just highly unevenly distributed. But we need to do much, much better. So maybe I'll end on a question that's incredibly relevant for everyone in this room and is kind of definitionally why Fifth Wall exists. Yeah. Why do you think? It is so hard for large organizations to do innovation and to invest in technology. Why has corporate venture capital kind of been challenged, and why do large organizations struggle to adopt new technology? People debate what's the critical number of employees. I guess my nomination would be 50. But when you grow past a certain size, everything changes. And groups that are wonderful at managing a team of like 17 become dysfunctional often when they're at 74, wherever you want to put the point. It's like, oh my goodness, we needed a human resources department at 40, and we didn't have it. And you know, we're still going to do things a casual way, dynamic way. You need to bureaucratize in some ways. That slows down change. And the ability to create and allow dynamic small teams within your larger group that do not screw everything up is just one of the very hardest things to do for humanity. And it's obvious plenty of places do it. But it's even more obvious most places don't. And it will always be hard. It's this kind of reconciliation of opposites. Yes, some parts bureaucratized, other parts dynamic, working together as a broad cooperative whole, but still independent, decentralized, moving parts. My goodness, it's like German philosopher Hegel had a hard enough time with that. So how are we supposed to do it? But nonetheless, you see phenomenal superstar companies out there. It's solved all the time. But most companies are not superstar firms. And uh, America has more of those companies than any other country by far, even in per capita terms. So I think that will spread, as I said, to absolutely every sector, including real estate. You all here are probably the people who are doing it. And I'm really excited and looking forward uh, to what you're going to do for me and my daughter. So thank you all, and thank you for the interview. Thank you, Tyler.